morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here to speak to you on this topic. And I'd like to start by thanking JISC and the DPC for this invitation to speak to you about costs and value. Um, I'm principally going to be talking about costs and value of curating research data. But for those of you who are from different sectors, I would stress that a lot of what I'm saying is transferable really to the management of any form of digital asset and to digital preservation generally. So I'm approaching it, if you like, illustrating it from research data, but a lot of what I'm going to say has, has wider value. I'm also going to be talking primarily about the economic approaches to costs and value. There are other approaches which are complementary as well. You have things like data citation. There are a number of different ways that you could look at value which don't necessarily approach it in an economic way. But the economics does get you a long way, if you have those numbers, in terms of sustainable funding and business cases. So that's where I'm going to focus today. Um, it's something, as William was saying, that I've been interested in probably on and off for over a decade in terms of a research interest. And although I'm going to be presenting it to you really from a personal point of view, I think I'm going to stress, first of all, that this always has been a collaboration. Um, there are a number of people and organizations that have been major partners in all the research projects that I'm going to be presenting to you. JISC has been a major funder of many of them, and a lot of universities and other digital um, archives and centers have been involved in the research. So what am I going to try and cover? Well, first of all, I'm going to start off by approaches to uh, estimating the costs and how you can uh, look at that. I want to move on then to talking about valuing intangible assets. And we've had quite a long introduction um, background there from both Paul, I think, and William, setting out some of the reasons why intangibles and approaches to valuing intangibles are important, and particularly focusing on the quantitative economic approaches uh, to measuring those values. Then finally, I want to look at where we might go from here. I want to refer to the What to Keep study, which was a GIST report which came out earlier this year, and then to look at Infonomics, um, a book um, produced with an industry perspective, really, on the valuation of information in companies. And finally, then, to conclude with some thoughts uh, about areas which we might move forward in future years. So starting with costs. And costs I'm going to break down into three major areas. First of all, we have activity cost models. There are many examples of these. Um, I've seen whole sheets of A4 filled up with cost models. There's a lot you can choose from. But I think the key thing to notice is that only a couple of those really are generic, intended for broadly based communities. Most when you look at them are organization specific and often derived from those generic models. Even when somebody says, this is unique, it's for our institution, they've tended to go and look at those generic models and perhaps uh, a substantial amount of it will be derived from them. The other key thing to say is that an activity cost model requires substantial effort to create. There are major research projects in their own right um, to evolve. The second thing, once we've got activity cost models, what we're able to do is produce activity cost data. So it can be created then in a consistent form using an activity cost model. And it means the, the costs are comparable. They've been put together on an on a equivalent basis. Cost data still takes significant effort to collect and may be incomplete. And the reason for that, if you like, the total costs of curation uh, can be distributed across many budget centers and departments. Some of the costs may come in things like uh, indirect uh, forms of contribution for things like accommodation. So actually bringing those costs together and understanding what your costs are and comparing them uh, across different organizations or even the cost of doing something in-house compared to outsourcing it to a service provider can be a very difficult thing to do. 
And the final thing we can do, um, once we have activity cost data, I think, is look at cost trends. And cost data can give trends and laws, or if you like, rules of thumb, that are very powerful tools. If we look at the um, information technology industry, whole decades of investment, really, in, in the industry have been based on a number of very simple laws like Crider's and Moore's Law, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. So they can be very powerful tools. I think you can look at costs really in terms of a, a knowledge pyramid. If you like, there's effort and use. And the cost models are at the base of those that pyramid. We, we really need to invest in developing those in order to progress anything else on costs. It probably takes the most effort to do and probably has the fewest number of direct users, the number of people can apply, apply them. But once we have them in place, we're able to develop um, cost data. And we have cost data uh, coming out of projects like KRDS. There's a cost survey within that. We have the 4C cost of curation uh, calculator, which we've also heard about in the introductions and a number of others. So we can start to generate cost data in a comparable form. Once well, we have the cost data, sorry, wrong way, we can then start looking at uh, the rules of thumb. Can we evolve some of these cost trends? And there are a number of uh, rules of thumb which exist, like Crider's Law, Moore's Law, and some of the things I'm going to talk about from the KRDS project and called KRDS Laws. Uh, which can be abstracted from that, those studies. So looking at costs, rules of thumb, these are rules for a prolonged but not an eternal period of time. So they're not quite laws. They often hold for many decades um, before they begin to change. A very good example is Crider's law around disk storage, where the costs of disk storage have been roughly halving in cost every year over many decades, even more than this graph shows. But laws don't, uh, sorry, rules of thumb don't exist forever. And in fact, we started to document uh, a reset in Crider's law from about 2010 onwards, uh, which is identified by uh, David Rosenthal uh, and, and uh, Preti Gupta. So this graph shows their projections for what that reset has been doing. Uh, David earlier this year actually published some data which we've had in terms of costs uh, per gigabyte for the last couple of years. And it shows that that projection uh, they had for the reset is almost uh, bang on line. The, the uh, data points are coming in between those two red projected lines. So we now have a reset for Crider's Law uh, beginning to establish itself. And from the Keeping Research Data Safe KRDS project, I think we had a number of rules of thumb which we developed. And I think over time I've come to regard that these are perhaps the most important things which came out of KRDS. Probably more important perhaps than even the benefits framework or the cost model. And we had, I think, four rules of thumb which we developed. First of those was that getting data in takes about half of the lifetime costs preservation about a sixth, and access about a third. Those were across a very broad range of um, archive services. And I think that's very been very important. Perhaps people tended to, beginning before KRDS, just to, as, uh, to say that digital preservation was very expensive, potentially very expensive. What we have here is a better breakdown and understanding that the ingest part of the uh, preservation is expensive, something that takes about half the cost. The preservation bit itself, actually, managing that into the long term, was not unreasonable. And access costs, keeping up with research needs and how people want to access the data, again, is the other significant part of that cost. And knowing that has allowed a number of data services to develop business models, which are sort of endowment models where they try and work out a cost which they can charge to a research grant, try to get as much of the initial cost covered as possible, and then work out ways, of, if you like, covering the remaining long-term costs uh, as part of their business model. 
The second rule of thumb was that preservation costs decline over time. Now this was quite a difficult one and still quite a difficult one to validate because very few organizations have their costs over a long period of time in a comparable way. The archaeology data service which we had access to and their data from the data establishment was one of the few that we could look at. Most organizations tend to change the basis on which they do their accounting and their finances over a decade or more. So it can be difficult to have this sort of long-term uh, data sets. The third was that fixed costs are significant for most data archives. And what we meant by that is that the cost of actually setting up, the cost of having staff, the costs of uh, the technical setup, is a, a fixed cost, typically. It's a minimum amount, regardless of the amount of data. It took a lot of scaling up of the size of the data collection before that uh, broke down and it sort of had an effect. So you need a minimum number of people to run a, a service. You need to have to cover sick leave. You need to cover holidays. You need to cover different so sorts of expertise. And that means that fixed costs uh, are there and a, a set up cost. And again, that's quite significant for the business models for small to medium archives. It means economies of scale are important. And some archives, for example, in the social, uh, social sciences, uh, may look to add other types of collection, be it arts and humanities or something like um, population data uh, and health population uh, to their collections as a way of getting those economies of scale beyond their initial collection. And finally, staff are the most significant proportion of archive costs. This varied uh, substantially. It's always the majority cost, but it could be up to 90%. So the technology costs, the storage costs, just those sort of costs, the sort of going into Tesco's, William put it, looking for your terabyte of storage. The reason, one of the big reasons that it's such a big difference is it's because it's staff and the management of the data, uh, which is expensive. Um, I mentioned here, and I th I'm just going to mention it because I think uh, we have um, a, n a number of presentations on the Dutch Digital Heritage Network research um, on digital preservation costs. And that's provided further independent valuation of some of these KRDS laws, particularly uh, the first law and the fourth, so around uh, the, the cost of uh, ingest um, and also um, that staff are the most significant proportion of archive costs. So that's been quite useful, I think, independent validation of some of these uh, rules of thumb. Moving on to valuing intangible assets. Um, how do we approach valuing things like research data or assets in our institutions which are, are digital and intangible? I think first thing to mention is a valuable approach to digital preservation and intangibles uh, was developed by uh, Laurie Hunter, who is a professor of economics in Glasgow. And it's been since adapted for research data in particular. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. The other key thing to say is that we measure the value of data services, not just data alone. Um, this is something that takes a while for funders to get, I think. And it's very frustrating sometimes for the staff of data services that they don't understand a data service is much more than just the data. And measuring the value of intangible assets is hard, much harder than for physical assets. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a moment. So the economic methods for doing it are well established, but it's extremely difficult to get the cost and value data to use in them. Um, the other thing to say is the counterfactual, a baseline of, of the costs of doing nothing are important and a very important way of checking of that, if you like, the reality of the valuations which are being put on intangible uh, uh, assets. And I've been working uh, in collaboration in recent years with John Houghton, who was a professor of economics in Australia, uh, to move beyond quantitative value to financial measures of value uh, in recent years. So to give you a model which I think is a very useful way of thinking about um, 
the value of uh, data archives. You can have two views, one which is, if you like, looking at the physical assets, which are things like the buildings, the equipment, uh, the networks, grid, ICT networks and equipment, and the staffing uh, of the institution. And those, if you like, are physical assets, the sort of things that you tend to find in the balance sheet, in your budgets. The alternative way of looking at it is as intangible assets. And there are four forms of intangible capital. The first of them, if you like, uh, intellectual capital is really around the data, but it is only the first. The second is around the human capital, that's the skills and training of the staff in that data centre their expertise in the management of data and in their subject areas. The third is organisational capital and that's the policies and procedures of that institution which gives you trust in that data and its authenticity and it it's maintains its quality. It also covers things, if you like, around the investment made by the organisation in things like data standards, the development of thesauri, information management generally, which allows users to be able to manipulate access and make use and find value in the data. And the fourth and final one is around relationship capital, which is professional networks. And this is where institutions like the Digital Preservation Coalition add value for its members. And for those of you who come from universities, uh, that sort of professional networks and relationship capital tends to be where study after study on impact and knowledge transfer usually identifies the, the key difference of what makes successful knowledge transfer, successful impact from research, tends to be the relationship capital and their networks with other outside organisations and peer organisations. So professional networks and that relationship capital is very important in terms of impact. And I found this a very useful, helpful way of thinking about uh, research data archives and where they contribute value as a model. So I mentioned I've been working on value and economic impact uh, studies with John Houghton, and there's been four joint studies to date. And we've applied economic methods of measurement to the economic and social data service, which is a, a pre predecessor to the UK data service um, run principally by the UK Data Archive today. The Archaeology Data Service, the British Atmospheric Data Centre and the European Bioinformatics Institute. So partly by design and partly by chance we've covered the four major areas if you like of research disciplines. So we've looked at the social sciences, uh, part of the humanities, uh, a service in physical sciences and uh, a service in the biological and medical arena. And the economic methods used uh, are these. I'm not going to go into detail too much today on them because you can read about them uh, in the reports, but there's investment value, use value, contingent value, efficiency gain, and then we have a return on investment in the data service, which if you like is a standard return on investment for the funder of that service. And also a return on investment in the data creation in some of those services. And that's the estimated increase in return on investment to the funders in the data creation due to the additional use facilitated by the data service. And that's important perhaps because you don't always have the same funders. Those who fund the creation of the data may be very different from those who are funding um, um, uh, the archiving and long-term use of the material. So perhaps the key thing to stress there is that there are multiple economic methods being applied and multiple data points also underpinning those methods. And effectively they stretch from, if you like, quite direct measures of value, the investment value and the use value, through to things like contingent valuation uh, and efficiency impacts estimated by the users, through to things like return on investment in, in the data, which are um, uh, in terms of uh, the reuse value of the data, 
uh, potentially then through to wider impacts on, on society at large. So we're focusing in our approaches to really the user com uh, community for research data. So it's principally within that user community. Uh, there are some society values captured within that, um, but there are other ways of approaching some of the wider impacts outside of the research uh, arena. And these approaches really, I think, in the end, boil down to some of the things that you can say about the return on investment, the benefit to the cost ratio of the net, e net economic value uh, to the operational costs. And we were able to say, for example, for the economic and social data service, that for every pound invested in the data service, uh, there's five pounds, 40 pence in terms of value returned to the funders. So it's comes down to very simple numbers, but they're very powerful numbers when they come down to um, presenting uh, investment cases uh, to, to government and departments. And a big part, I think, of that value, um, when you look at the study, I think comes from researcher efficiency gains. And I'm just going to highlight the very high reported efficiency gains reported by users of the EDS as a result of having the data center there and being able to access the data uh, through the EDS. And I'll come back to this point again in a moment. Counterfactuals. I said counterfactuals are very important. The costs of inaction. And again, there was a study by um, Technopolis, a report to what was then the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills, I think it was. And the report was called Big Science and Innovation, which looked at 100 uh, economic impact studies for research infrastructure internationally. And it said that ideally economic impact assessments should estimate the counterfactual, what would occur in the absence of a facility. However, they found that counterfactuals are rarely addressed in the studies reviewed due to the lack of data. And they only found two examples, one of them being uh, the economic impact assessment of the EDS I've already mentioned, uh, and another, which was a, a large-scale science facility in the UK, uh, which they said um, the estimation was not done rigorously. So uh, they weren't very keen on that study. Um, costs of inaction. Now, this is very faint here. I've tried to pull together in one of the studies that we did for SESTA of everything I could find in the research literature relating to the costs of inaction, of doing nothing. Um, first, I've broken these up into a number of different areas. Absolute loss and the rates of research, um, rates of loss of research data sets. There's only one study that I found for this, and I'm, I'm a bit doubtful that it's uh, in any way, um, how shall I put this, an average. I think it's an outlier. There's something strange about this data set because there's a data rate loss of 17% per year, per annum, being shown in that research study. And I think that's very high, and it must relate to perhaps a very short retention period, perhaps of five years or something like that. But I didn't have time to dig into that data, and it'd be interesting to find out why there's such a high rate there. I think it'd be much lower uh, for most other research data sets. But we know, I think, from um, just digital preservation generally, it's often very hard to find case studies of absolute data loss. It's not just the fact that um, perhaps people are reluctant to talk about them, but I think that they are relatively, um, relatively rare. What is more common, I think, and what happens uh, more generally is what you might call partial information loss. It's information rot. And we can measure some of this um, remotely uh, through things like the rate of loss of working contact emails uh, for archiving via individual researchers, or the rate of loss for web links to data on personal websites, uh, again, for personal um, uh, researchers who have their own personal websites making access to data. And those rates of loss have been about 7% per annum or 5.5% per annum. And if you think of those adding up over a 10 to 20 year period, those are quite significant rates of information information rot in, in, in areas of, of the data. Even more significant, I think, is some of the data that's been published about access. 
the number of uh, data requests which have been fulfilled um, when uh, the material has been archived by individual researchers. And this is again quite key, I think, because many of these data sets are supposed to be available on request, either in terms of the funding terms and conditions or as open access. But a number of studies, and these are of different dates and for different types of research and uh, for different disciplines, have shown relatively low levels of fulfillment of data requests, as low as 25% in one study and only as high as about 60% in the best study. So that's a very high number of data sets when researchers asking for them uh, have not, not had been granted access to them. Also significant, I think, is the delay, uh, the elapsed time it takes to get hold of the data set. So the elapsed time to fulfill data requests uh, when they've been held by individual researchers, it can be up to six months in one study. And the best was one to three weeks in another study with a mean of 7.7 days. And I think however you look at this in terms of costs of inaction, it's very valuable to compare it to what you would expect to be uh, the comparable uh, metrics from a research uh, data archive and facility. You would expect to have uh, extremely high levels of retention and preservation of the data. You'd have very good maintenance of the data and the information and the links. Most of the access would be instantaneous for many of the data sets or a very short delay in obtaining approvals. And that means that the research becomes far more efficient. If you think back to those reported research efficiencies that we had in our study, and you look at these costs of inaction, I think you can see where the research efficiencies come from in terms of both the speed of access, the fact they don't have to write multiple uh, emails to data uh, holders to, to get hold of the data, the speed with which they get the data back, they're able to analyze it and publish it. Uh, again, that has uh, effects on in terms of research impact. So where could we go from here? Well, I want to, first of all, um, touch on the what to keep study and one of its recommendations in particular. And recommendation four in that study was to investigate the relative costs and benefits of differential curation levels, storage or appraisal for what to keep for the two major use cases that I it identified around research integrity and reuse. And the reason for that is I think that the majority of what we've been able to study in terms of costs and impact has been, um, has been really around the larger national data centers and those data sets which, if you like, are known to have and have been selected because they're known to have long-term reuse value. There's been a lot, there hasn't really been the same level of work uh, done on other types of research data collection. I think we need to look very carefully at that and there's been some very interesting studies done in the past and thinking done in the past about levels of curation. And that first, uh, first came out, I think, as a concept in a, a report on long-lived data collections done by the US National Science Board in 2005, which suggested that we should be trying to differentiate between different types of collection because research data, not all research data has the same value and trying to imply investment accordingly. And I think there were some interesting examples in the what to keep study identified, if you like, of two tier systems with differential curation levels um, emerging. One at the UK uh, data service and another in the Netherlands at DANS. And in the Netherlands, they developed a Dataverse NL for short-term data management. That's up to 10 years. And then its main easy catalog uh, and curation for long-term archiving. And the UK Data Service has developed a similar two-tier system uh, in recent years. So both these systems have different time horizons for how long the data is kept, potentially kept. Uh, costs in terms of metadata and preservation care, how it is capped for their two systems. 
with the option to move from short-term storage to long-term systems and curation levels after future appraisal or alternatively to be maintained in their existing short-term system or, or deleted. So the intriguing thing for me in terms of uh, the feedback in the interviews that we had in the What to Keep study is we were being told that there was a, a significant cost differential between uh, running these two systems. And that hasn't been quantified as yet, but I think it would be a very interesting thing for follow-up research in the future. The other thing I'd like to point um, um, out in terms of future direction in, uh, is perhaps some of the work which is being done um, by big companies like Gartner on valuing uh, information, digital information in companies. And uh, Infonomics, uh, this book um, by Douglas B. Laney uh, at Gartner, is I think an example of that industry-centric view of the valuation of information and some of the challenges involved. Uh, which are very similar to our to our own fields. And he has some lovely quotes on accounting for information. So I'm going to give you some quotes now. So for five or six decades since the beginning of the information age, the namesake of this age and the major asset driving today's economy is still not considered an accounting asset. So this comes back to the point that William was making at the beginning that the accounting profession still doesn't really have a good way of accounting for intangibles. Corporations typically exhibit greater discipline in tracking and accounting for their office furniture than their data. I think the bottom line is that data stewards are not alone in seeing this as an anomaly. There are others pressing for changes to insurance and accounting practices, as William pointed out. I think it's also interesting to look at the uh, information valuation model in, uh, in Infonomics, uh, developed by Gartner, and comparing it to some of the things that I've been talking to you about as approaches uh, to the valuation of research data, or even uh, digital preservation and other forms of digital assets. And we can map very closely onto this uh, Gartner model, uh, the things that I've been talking to you about for research data. So the things that he's talking about, about intrinsic value of information, how correct, how complete and exclusive is this data, are things like uh, the what to keep study, uh, the NERC data value checklist. We have now quite a lot on how we can look at, if you like, the fundamental valuation uh, criteria. Uh, for, for data. In terms of what he calls the performance value of information, which largely is based around obtaining experimental data, that maps exactly onto the costs of inaction. If we look at the financial measures that he has, the cost value of information is the investment value. And if we want to look at the market value of information, well, we don't have a market because it's open data, it's freely available. But we do have methods in terms of contingent valuation of being able to estimate the same sort of thing for, for open data. So that's a contingent valuation. And then if we look at the economic value of information, uh, how does this data contribute to the bottom line? Well, that's really the return on investment what we're reporting back to the funders. So I think this makes quite a good overall model of how to approach valuation and is adaptable also to uh, non-industry, non non-commercial um, forms, forms of data in the way that I've just shown. So in terms of conclusions, I think we can use collections of cost data to look for trends and I would suggest that the rules of thumb are probably the most widely useful cost information. It's something that even very small archives with only two, uh, perhaps one or two members of staff, can easily apply. It's much, perhaps much harder for smaller archives uh, to do so with things like uh, the, the actual cost models or sometimes even to capture their own cost data. Datanomics and infonomics have synergies. We may be able to leverage efforts within our community and within industry in terms of approaching the valuation of intangibles and data.
we need to investigate the relative costs and benefits of different different uh, curation levels, storage or appraisal for the two major use cases identified in the What to Keep study. And perhaps to also say that if we have hierarchical storage management in uh, IT, in other words, moving uh, um, data between different types of storage and costs of storage automatically. In time, can we look towards automating some decisions as hierarchical curation management, particularly as our research data collections grow and the cost of, if you like, manual intervention and recording uh, increases? So I think those are the things which I would like to, to offer in conclusion. I'll point to some further information sources which you can go and look in more detail at some of the things that I've been talking about today in terms of cost, benefits and return on investment for research data. There's a very good, uh, I think, uh, cost benefit advocacy toolkit um, prepared for the says to Saul project with a set of very simple fact sheets on return on investment costs uh, and benefits and a number of tools which are, are, are very helpful, I think. Uh, the Economic Impact Studies Research Data Services. Uh, there's uh, a short synthesis of three recent, of the three, of three of the studies at least, uh, which was funded and published by GIST. So that brings all the research reports down to about 30 pages as an overview for you, in terms of the methods. And then there's um, the Infonomics book, um, which you are, are welcome to read. I suggest skipping quite a few of the middle chapters. Look at the beginning and the end. Um, but you can always skim through the others, but they may not be as relevant and as interesting to you. Okay, and on that, I'd like to finish. And was there time for some short questions, William, I think, in the program? We'll do that usual thing. Is this on? Uh, yes, we've got time for a few questions. Uh, what we'll also do is we'll do a, a quick setup. I think Sharon's going to do a quick setup for uh, Mary and for yeah. uh, uh, Patricia, who are beaming in. But we do have time for questions. So, Paul, I saw your hand going up straight away. Should we? Yeah, I'll keep this one. Uh, can we let sh Can we let yep. Paul have a question? <laughs> <laughs> Please. Why not? Um, Paul Stokes, Jisk. Um, I'm assuming this is on. Um, Neil, wonderful as usual. Um, one thing that, that that concerns me about the benefits and uh, analysis of, uh, uh, for instance, the, the five to one figure in terms of, of return on investment is that the benefit is um, gained by those who haven't invested. There's more often than not a um, discrepancy or, or a disconnect, rather, between those who have invested the money and those who are gaining the benefit. Um, I, I, ha have you been able to address this and, and see how that benefit could be returned directly to those who are paying for it? Because the argument of, of the good of society only holds true for a certain strata, not for um, many of the people involved in this area. I suppose in terms of what we try to do in return on investment, not just on the investment in data center, but also on the creation of the research data um, and funders in that, which obviously is all public money, ultimately. I would suggest that you know that's sort of the the efficiencies mean that the public at least is getting better bang for the buck in investment in the science infrastructure uh, in particular. So you know it's a public benefit that you can see from that. There are ways of looking at sort of wider economic impact, the sort of things which tend to come out, I guess. Uh, often universities or research funders are talking about impact, which is beyond the sector. Uh, the value to others. So there are other ways of looking at it, yes, uh, which which go beyond that. And we point to some of those things, but I'm not, it is something which we kept within our research user community in terms of our approaches, but there are other ways of looking at the value of research to society as a whole. Um, the difficulty it tends to be, I guess, some of the figures for that tend to be better from technology and sciences and there's far less data for the social sciences and the humanities. So it's uh, uneven. Seems to me you got Kay. away with that uh, very lightly. Yep, okay. uh, I can take no, this no, off. No, 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 not quite. No. 
Matilda from HSBC. Yeah. Um, in terms of the costs of inaction, in a kind of a basic sense, I would assume that those are usually less than the costs of taking action. And so in terms of actually practically presenting these to your stakeholders when asking for funding, how would you suggest staging that? Because um, there would be a temptation if the cost of inaction is so low in regards to the money you're asking for, what is um, what are the kind of ways that you could present that to um, encourage investment rather than potentially spark a, a seed of thought that actually maybe we don't need to do this? I think, the, well, the key thing to say is that spending nothing costs money to them. Um, I think that's something that uh, William was trying to point out. If you don't actually spend money early, it's more expensive later. So I can think of examples of institutions who have, say, a digital workflow, which is very much like a physical workflow. Um, information, digital information has come in on a physical character, uh, carrier. It's been put on the shelf. It's been managed fairly minimally in terms of investment in, in IT infrastructure and the digital preservation system. The problem for them is a decade later, they have a stack of digital information which is on hard drives, it's on USB sticks, it's on CDs, and there's a cost then at getting that information back, if they can get it back, which can be quite high. So not investing at the beginning in having a workflow and treating digital information, recording it and getting it into a system where it can be managed properly at the beginning uh, has a cost later down the line. And quite often, almost, I suspect, leads to some of that almost being written off. Um, similarly, if you look at research data, figures of the costs of inaction that I'm giving you, if the data is not available for research, if researchers are writing emails and 50% of the data which has been generated uh, for them isn't available for the next researcher to reuse, even then if that's what the funder is aiming for. That's a huge cost to research. Um, potentially it may mean some of the best data sets aren't available. Maybe it's good enough, but it may not be as wide a range of data as being seen. Um, there's costs around reproducibility and trust in the science if people can't see the data. Um, there's the whole thing of the data does get lost. Um, I can think of a number of examples in archaeology, probably not digital, these are physical, I'll think of some digital ones in a moment, where if the, a good example would be Stonehenge, a famous example, an excavation at Stonehenge where the original excavator held onto it as a personal archive, lots of it got lost, it was, it was in his attic, this was physical archive, but it could have been digital, you know. If it rots, it's not well cared for compared to how it's, uh, when it's in a, uh, a managed environment. So I think all those things have costs. It means total loss of in, in information. It means partial loss of the information quality. Quite often quality deteriorates as well, and I think that's very widespread. It may mean trust and authenticity in the data is lost. There's a, a lot of potential costs that you could bring out. 